वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर अनिता भेला फ्रॉम द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ डेली एंड टूडे वी विल बी स्टडिंग जॉनसन्स प्रेफेस टू शेक्सपियर विच हैज बीन रिटन बाय मी जॉनसन्स प्रेफेस वॉज अपेंडेड टू हिज एडिशन ऑफ शेक्सपियर एंड टूडे इट हैज been acknowledged as a great piece of literary criticism in the preface johnson talks about the excellencies and the faults of shakespeare like a true neoclassical critic he tries to create a balance between praise and blame let us study a little about johnson's life before we go on to an analysis of the preface to shakespeare johnson was born in 1709 he was the son of a bookseller right from birth he developed a tubercular infection which he got from his nurse which left him with a bad eyesight and partial deafness later he also suffered from a bout of smallpox which left him with scars in spite of his handicaps johnson was a very determined person although he could not play the regular sports which other people did he did to climbing uh, jumping and skating or doing various other activities which he possibly could he had a great exposure to books because his father was a bookseller and he had a great love for knowledge and then he studied in a grammar school and later went to oxford but had to leave in between because of financial difficulties there is an interesting story which goes about johnson while he was at oxford he was wearing shoes that were torn with his toes coming out and one of one gentleman placed a pair of new shoes in front of his door one night the next morning when johnson saw that pair of shoes he was extremely angry and threw them away in disgust he did not believe in getting it anything in charity for a short time once he was out of oxford he went to depression but the porters helped him out he started writing and in that year he published a book of translation and he got some money from with the help of which he was able to open a school and david garrick who later became a shakespeare well known shakespeare actor was a pupil there but his school was not a success and so he married elizabeth after the death of her husband then moved to london the year 1745 proved a literary turning point in johnson's life he published a pamphlet on macbeth that won him warburton's praise which he valued highly because it came at a time when he most needed it At this time he also began thinking about publishing an English dictionary. Johnson planned to complete his ambitious project in 3 years, but it took him nearly 8 years to complete. This in itself was a remarkable achievement. The dictionary was published in 1755. Why was this a remarkable achievement? Because the dictionaries published before and after 
took many more years to publish and were the collaborative work of many scholars but he single handedly achieved this task as a result of the publication of the dictionary he received 1575 pounds for the project his preface to the, to his edition of shakespeare was published in 1765 in 1756 johnson published his proposal for printing by subscription the dramatic works of william shakespeare corrected and illustrated by samuel johnson and once the subscription had been advertised he received large sums of money from people and he hastily had promised to complete the work in a year's time but he was unable to bring it out at the proposed time he came under seething attacks especially by the poet charles churchill the upbraiding in verse by charles churchill made him restart work on the edition of shakespeare and it was finally published in eight volumes october size in 1765 and nearly 9 years after the publication of the proposal the collection is known for its preface which was of 72 pages in johnson's edition and this preface has been acknowledged as the best part of the edition and as the best piece of neoclassical literary criticism his biographer and friend boswell states a blind in discriminate admiration of shakespeare had exposed the british nation to the ridicule of foreigners johnson by candidly admitting the faults of his poet had the more credit in bestowing on him deserved an indisputable praise boswell Johnson's interest in Shakespeare began when he was very young. He had read Shakespeare's plays and poems with great intensity, and his fascination for Shakespeare continued throughout his life. His dictionary has almost 80,000 quotations from Shakespeare. The preface has two sections. The first section deals with Shakespeare as a dramatist. and the second section deals with johnson as an editor of shakespeare's plays and talks about the very the various amendments or explanatory notes that he has added and how he has tried to arrive at some how he has tried to arrive at an addition which would be as close to the original as possible johnson begins his preface by telling us that people cherish everything that is ancient anything that hair that has the air of antiquity about it is praised by the people he says antiquity is to be praised is to be valued but not because it is ancient because but because it deals with universal truths and talking of shakespeare he says that shakespeare's popularity has not waned over time he has stood the test of time and therefore he can be added to the canon of the ancients because his plays have stood the time and have survived and therefore shakespeare needs to be honored johnson in his analysis of shakespeare has a multi dimensional approach he approaches him for var- from various angles he sees him as timeless and universal he sees him as a product of his age and time he also tries to see shakespeare from the point of view of a neo classicist that is he tries to create a balance between shakespeare's excellencies and his faults 
he tries to make a distinction between what may have appealed to Shakespeare's contemporaries and what appeals to his own and future generations. In the first part of the preface, Johnson points towards Shakespeare being a poet of nature. He says, Shakespeare presents us with a faithful description of life. He says, Shakespeare presents characters and situations as if they were situations in which we could find ourselves. And his characters are not generalized people, but each character is distinct and individualized, although they present universal human emotions. He also talks about Shakespeare dealing not only with the passion of love, as some other dramatists would do, but that he deals with other passions of mankind as well. He views Shakespeare's plays neither as tragedies nor as comedies, but as representations of, that exhibit the real state of sublunary nature, which partakes of good and evil, joy and sorrow. Talking about the ancients and comparing Shakespeare to them, Johnson says that while the ancients were perfect at the art either of writing comedy or tragedy, Shakespeare was a master at both. He achieved as much greatness in writing comedy as he did tragedy. And he says that the aim of all art is to instruct by pleasing. He also defends Shakespeare for mingling tragedy and comedy, in fact, for tra mingling tragic and comic scenes. If we go back to Sydney, Sydney did not like the mixing of tragic and comic scenes and said there should be no mixing of horns and pipes and kings and funerals. But he felt, Johnson felt that this mingling added variety to Shakespeare's plays. He, he finds this mingling also justified because he feels that Shakespeare's plays both instruct and delight. And as some critics have said, that this mingling weakens the passions, Johnson does not find any evidence of that. Rather, he feels that this mingling contributes to pleasure. Johnson's views on Shakespeare's comedies. Johnson felt that Shakespeare was a genius in writing comedy that there was a naturalness about his comic scenes, whereas his tragic scenes seem to be the effort of labor. And it appears that to Johnson that Shakespeare took his dialogues in the comic scenes from the common intercourse of life and therefore their appeal has not diminished over time. Being a true neoclassicist, Johnson must create a balance between Shakespeare's excellencies and Shakespeare's faults. So after praising Shakespeare for depicting universal human emotions, for writing excellent comedy and tragedy. He goes on to find faults in Shakespeare. Johnson had high expectations from art. 
just as Sydney had, that art was to teach morals, that art should depict poetic justice, that in art the evil should be punished and the good should be rewarded. And Johnson finds this missing in many plays of Shakespeare. He says that being true to life is not enough because you may say that in life it doesn't always happen that the good are rewarded and the evil punished. There is no poetic justice in life. But according to Shakespeare, the artist must know better. He must not show negativity to the audience because the audience is always aware that they are watching a play. And in this context, Johnson feels that Shakespeare sacrificed virtue to convenience and that his emphasis was more on pleasing than in instructing. Johnson felt that a play in which the wicked prosper and the virtuous miscarry may doubtless be good because some people feel it is a just representation of life. But he says all reasonable human beings love justice. And he says he cannot believe that if justice is shown in a play, it will make the play worse if the other excellencies are equal. He says the audience will rise better pleased when they experience the final triumph of justice. Johnson also finds fault with Shakespeare's plots. If we go back to Aristotle, Aristotle said that the plot was extremely important and that a plot must have a beginning, a middle and an end and that it should be the result of cause and effect. That is, earlier events should lead to the climax. Johnson felt that Shakespeare's plots were very loosely constructed, that he did not care much for the construction. He also felt that many times Shakespeare missed the opportunities for giving instruction in his plays. Johnson also finds Shakespeare guilty of violating chronology and verisimilitude relating to time and place. He gives us two examples. He says that in Hector, we find Hector quoting Aristotle. And in Traulus and Cressida, the love of Theseus and Hippolyta is combined with the Gothic mythology of fairies. Although Johnson appreciates Shakespeare's comedy, yet he is not blind to his faults. He says that there is a lot of coarseness in his dialogues. And he says that this kind of coarseness may have been prevalent in Shakespeare's own time, but that was no reason for Shakespeare to include it in his plays because an artist should know better. He also finds certain faults in Shakespeare's tragedies which he thinks are the, excess, are the result of excessive labor. There is tediousness in the speeches sometimes and there is many a time unnecessary repetition. And many a times he finds that the words spoken by the characters do not match the occasion.
violation of chronology and verisimilitude relating to time and he also finds that many a time there is a sudden drop in the emotional temperature caused in certain speeches of his characters through the infelicity of language either a pun a conceit or a hyperbole Johnson directs a scathing attack on Shakespeare's fondness for a quibble. He describes Shakespeare's love for a quibble through various amusing analogies. He says a quibble was to him the golden apple for which he will stoop from his elevation or the fatal Cleopatra for which he was willing to lose the world and was content to lose it. Next we come to Shakespeare's violation of the unities. Again if we go back to Sidney who advocated that all dramatists should follow the classical writers and must stick to the unities. Johnson went against the general feeling of this time. that a playwright must stick to the unities he talks about the unities in shakespeare's plays he keeps the histories out of the purview because he says that by virtue of their very nature the time and place of the histories keeps changing regarding the unity of time and place he defends shakespeare He tells us that Shakespeare follows the unity of action and that is the most important. He says all those who go against and say that the unities must be followed are those who believe and say that since the audience is watching a play they cannot believe that Uh, about a certain lapse of time or a sudden change of place but johnson refutes their arguments by saying that the audience is always aware that they are watching a play if they can imagine sitting in a theater in london that they are in any country other country than in london then how is it difficult for them if the scene takes place in different places they will always accept it so it is not an argument that is tenable similarly that the action should revolve around a single revolution of the sun he says if they can, if they can accept that the play is make believe then they can even accept that passage of time of many years because if in 3 hours they can imagine the passage of one day they can surely imagine the passing away of much longer periods of time between scenes in the play johnson considers shakespeare a pioneer in many ways although much not much is known about shakespeare and his learning johnson felt that he was naturally learned and he says that none of his he's extremely inventive and original and he's nothing he has nothing derived from the works of other writers and he puts him high in status state his status he puts comparable to that of home especially in the manner of invention or in the he also appreciates shakespeare for establishing the harmony of blank verse and to discover the qualities of smoothness and harmony in the language and the first playwright whose 
tragedies as well as comedies were equally successful and gave appropriate pleasure now to come to the second section of the preface which deals with shakespeare's texts in order to know about why johnson needed to bring about his edition of shakespeare's plays is important Firstly Shakespeare although he was an extremely popular playwright was not highly respected in his own time In fact the university which called him the upstart crow who had adorned their feathers But Johnson is critical of Shakespeare firstly for not getting his own plays published secondly for being very careless even for those that were some that were in circulation not to pay attention to accuracy and detail many errors had crept into shakespeare's edition of plays because of the printing process because of the copywriting because the actors were given their speeches and many of them changed them over their over their own accord so that it was difficult to arrive at an authentic version of shakespeare's original text the quarto and the folio editions were available but not that easily johnson tried to get hold of as many as he could but there were people who were not that willing so he made them with whatever he could a number of editions were published before johnson's own edition came we have alexander pope's edition published in 1725 lew thorwald's edition 1734 sir thomas hammer's edition 1744 and warburton's edition 1747 Now what did these editors do Many of them arbitrarily made many changes Some of them amended whole lines and added copious notes Johnson felt that as an editor and critic it was his duty to to keep as close to the original as possible in fact we can say that he brought about a kind of variorium edition of shakespeare's plays he referred to all the others and what they had to say about particular lines he said he was he had exercised a great deal of restraint in making emendations he said that he he did not wish to make too many just on his own judgment he also felt that in future times there may be others who might find other things more probable and they could make those changes he also added notes and comments he felt that notes were necessary evils to understand many of shakespeare's plays but what was his advice to the reader his advice to the reader was that first read the play his advice to the reader was to read the play out of interest to get pleasure out of it and once he had received that pleasure then he could go into the details to appreciate different lines and passages and for that johnson's notes would be invaluable so as an editor of shakespeare 
he exercised restraint he brought in the notes comments of the other editors as well and refrained from making too many amendments as the earlier editors had done thus we see that johnson's preface to shakespeare even by modern standards is an exemplary piece of literary criticism although we do acknowledge that it has its limitations we must appreciate johnson for giving us a balanced view of shakespeare and also for going against the grain of his time in defending shakespeare for not following the unities johnson considered the text superior to any rules and felt that the real test of a work of art lay in its effect on the reader not on rules and regulations johnson is also important for giving us the tools of criticism of comparison and the historical analysis many of his insights into shakespeare are so great and so profound that many of the judgments on shakespeare's universalis universality are something that which we can only repeat in johnson's own words because he said it so well let us sum up what johnson has to say about shakespeare johnson first establishes shakespeare as a great artist who has withstood the test of time next as a true neoclassical critic he focuses on shakespeare's excellencies as well as his faults he praises shakespeare for depicting universal human emotions and for depicting life he appreciates shakespeare for creating characters who are distinct from each other and yet representative he praises shakespeare as a writer of both tragedy as well as comedy he felt that he outdid the ancients in that who were proficient only in one he defends shakespeare against the violation of the unities of time and place in this he went against the grain of his time he thinks that shakespeare was a genius in writing comedy and that his tragedy shows labor we may not agree with him today on this point and yet that was johnson's opinion regarding shakespeare's faults johnson felt that many a time his language was coarse and the language was repetitive he also chastises shakespeare for using puns and quibbles and for marring certain scenes and reducing the intensity of the passion because of the language he is also critical about shakespeare's plots which are loosely constructed he is extremely critical about shakespeare's poetic justice as presented in his plays he says he very often sacrifices virtue to convenience he believes that it is always the duty of the artist the dramatist to present life better than it is <laughs>
he finally talks about his editorial methods he talks about the previous editions of shakespeare and the changes that he has brought about by today's standards we may not find his editorial standards that high but for his own time and age they were adequate the most important thing that is important about his editorial method is that he exercised restraint and we can say that in spite of his shortcomings johnson was a great neoclassical literary critic and to end we might just think of how his greatness is reflected because his age is very often called the age of johnson thank you for more details refer to the e text